requested this week to give a talk on uh, dependent origination. But um, actually the last couple of weeks talks have been <clears throat> kind of around that topic a little bit. So uh, I might um, forgo that for now. I'm very happy to talk about dependent origination again and again. I gave a series of Sutta classes in the monastery for six months talking about dependent origination. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, for tonight I thought I might twist it a little bit and talk about what, uh, um, actually it's, it's a kind of a Dhamma theme which doesn't have a particularly well-known name. And the name that I use for it is dependent liberation not dependent origination, which is like how the origination of suffering happens through causes and conditions. But this is dependent liberation, how freedom happens through causes and conditions. And uh, <coughs> this uh, gets to uh, kind of the heart of Buddhist practice. And one thing I always kind of remember, somebody made the remark once, I can't remember who it was. They said that uh, if you look in the ancient world, um, in ancient Greece, the ideal was wisdom. And in ancient China, the ideal was, was uh, virtue. And in India, the ideal was freedom. And I think that there's something to that. And this ideal of freedom is very characteristic of the way that Indian religions uh, work. So, Buddhism being a, um, no, I shouldn't say that, the Dhamma being a very sensible thing. I was going to say Buddhism being a very sensible thing, but that's not quite right actually, because <laughs> there's a lot of very unsensible things in Buddhism, but we don't need to talk about them quite now. But Dhamma being a very sensible thing, okay? it's very reasonable, uh, it's very balanced, then when we talk about liberation, um, the Buddha talked about, he didn't sort of spring it on us and, and sort of say it's sort of this kind of uncanny, unnatural thing. There's no um, secret to it. Liberation uh, arises, freedom arises in the mind uh, because of being appropriately prepared. When the mind is ready, then freedom is something that happens naturally. And so the Buddha talked about a, a series of conditions which um, lead to this freedom. And it's very interesting, actually. One of the things that I do dabble in is a little bit of uh, like the history of Buddhism and how the Buddha's texts are formed and things like that. And um, this particular teaching uh, is not very uh, well known or very emphasized in Theravada Buddhism. It seems to have been kind of a bit forgotten, uh, although it's still there in the text, but a bit kind of marginal. Um, but by comparing with other versions of the text found in Chinese and other places, it seems to be more emphasized and more central. And in fact, seems to have been like a pair. So dependent origination was like the pair of that was the dependent liberation, was the other side of it, the flip side. And just as dependent origination has 12 factors leading to the origin of suffering, dependent liberation has 12 factors leading to the ending of suffering and freedom from suffering. <clears throat> and uh, one of the interesting things about this uh, kind of sequence and flow of Dhamma is that uh, it starts with suffering itself. It begins with suffering. So if we don't suffer, we can't practice and we can't become free. which is actually very deeply true, isn't it? It's actually incredibly deeply true. If we didn't suffer, if none of you suffered, none of you would be here. <laughs> yeah? You'd go and do something sensible with your Friday night. You'd go to the pub or sit at home and watch a DVD or something like that. 
You come here because you're suffering. We feel pain. I suffer. I suffer heaps. That's why I try to practice Buddhism. You know, you can feel that pain. You can look inside yourselves now. You feel that. It's there. This is a reality. It's not because it's not a it's not a theory. It's an actual experience. And this is what uh, one of my favorite Dhamma sayings is Vedi Manasa Bikwe Idang Dukanti Panya Peti, Ayang Dukasamudayoti Panya Peti, Ayang Dukani Roda Huti Panya Peti, Ayang Dukani Roda Gamani Pati Padati Panya Peti. It is for one who feels that I declare this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is the ending of suffering, and this is the way of practice leading to the ending of suffering. For one who feels, that means you and me. That's the qualification that we need to be a Dhamma practitioner. Yeah? So sometimes people like to say, Oh, I don't have enough merit. I don't have enough Baramis. I can't practice the Dhamma. Maybe if I am good this life and give lots of dana and things, then next life I can be born as a man and then I'll be able to become a monk and then I'll be able to practice. That's what some people think. I don't really believe that actually. That's not what the Buddha said. The Buddha said, Vediyamanasa, for one who feels. That's, that's why the Buddha teaches. He teaches for one who feels. So that means all sentient beings, except for Australian males, of course. <laughs> But whether they're actually sentient or not is another question. But anyway, leave, <laughs> leaving aside those kinds of questions, for one who feels, I teach the Dhamma. Yeah? And so this is, this is why we have that sense of recognition when we come to the Dhamma. You know, we're not, you know, I remember when I did my first retreat, 28 days, right? And go in there and I knew, I knew nothing. I knew nothing about Buddhism. I never, I never any, done any practice. You go in there, they tell you, okay, sit down, watch your breath, watch your belly go up and down, note pain and stuff. Okay, right, I'll go and try and do that. And I got incredibly sick. I got this really bad dysentery and stuff like that. I had to go to the toilet like every 20 minutes for about three days or something like that. And my, my kuti was like 200 meters from the nearest toilet. <laughs> and so those monks would be sitting on their balconies kind of watching me go like this. And, and uh, it was, what, was, what made it really bad was that, that I, uh, uh, whenever I lay down, I got this incredibly throbbing headache, which would last for about 10 or 15 minutes. So I'd stagger back to my kuti, lie down, have this throbbing headache for 10 or 15 minutes, a couple of minutes of relief, and then I think, oh, God, I've got to go, go again. So I can get up and then back again. And then we're back. And so you go to the, go to you see your meditation teachers. They say, "Yes, just just be mindful." <laughs> yes, you're, you're you're learning to understand suffering. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. And so you just kind of meditate, meditate, meditate. And you know what was really good about one of the things that was really good about that retreat was that there was no doctrine. They didn't say anything. They didn't teach you anything, which was okay. I mean, I think for some people they maybe need a bit more, but for me it was really good because I wasn't sort of engaging on an intellectual level. I was just experiencing. And they only taught some very, very simple uh, things on that, that retreat. They taught about basic three kinds of feeling, pleasant, painful, neutral feeling, and a few things like that. And, um, and you just suffered a lot. And... Uh, and then you went through the suffering and you found the peace and found the joy. And after that, 
retreat. No one said anything. No one told to tell me you, this Buddhism is good because X, Y, Z or anything like that. You know. And after that, and I, I came out and I wrote a letter to my mum and my dad and I said, well, I guess I'm a Buddhist now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. No one told me to become a Buddhist. But it was just that recognition that that, that was so real. That was so real. And that's what the Buddha was teaching about. Yeah? And I thought, what, what can I do? What can I possibly do with the rest of my life except for try to understand this more, more deeply? What else is there to do? And so this is that first link in this dependent origination. Dukkha Upanisa Sadha. Suffering is the cause, the vital condition of faith. So suffering gives rise to faith. And they have this term Upanisa as used in this context. And Upanisa is a very interesting uh, word. It basically means causes. So Dukkha causes faith. Of course, if you know anything a little bit about philosophy, you know that there are different ways that things can cause things. And you have this, this basic distinction between a necessary and sufficient condition. So usually in Buddhism, a cause is a necessary condition. Okay. So that means that dukkha is a necessary condition for faith. That means if you don't have suffering, there's no way that faith will arise. But it's not a sufficient condition. That means that it doesn't stand by itself and determine that faith will arise. Other things have to play their part. It may be the case that faith will arise or not. And actually the Buddha said that uh, suffering will give rise to two things. In another sutta, two things. Either despair... Or a search. Yeah, two things, either despair or a search. Again, this is very interesting, isn't it? Yeah? This is the end, the end result of suffering. Either at the end of the day we despair or we think maybe there's something. Maybe there's somebody who knows about this suffering. And we search. And if we find that, then faith arises. But this idea of Upanisa doesn't just mean necessary condition because it also means something which is strongly conducive and very helpful. Okay? It's more active than just a necessary condition. Okay? So I translate it as a vital condition. Okay? It's a vital condition. It's both necessary and also strongly conducive. Yeah? But doesn't, it's not sufficient. So faith, and of course faith is the starting point of many good dhammas. We shouldn't be afraid of faith, all right? Sometimes modernist Buddhists, we like to say, oh, Buddhism doesn't have any faith. It's just completely rational. Well, it's a bit neurotic, actually. <laughs> the mind doesn't work like that, okay? You know, this is kind of a rationalist, kind of Western attempt to make Buddhism sound scientific. Of course, there's a role for faith in, in Buddhism, just as there's a role for faith in science. Of course, there is. You know, if you do science, if I want to do a physics experiment, I have faith that Albert Einstein knew what he was doing, you know. And I have faith that the people who've edited this scientific journal were competent and reliable. Of course, we have to work on faith all the time, yeah. We can't verify everything. So, but it's reasoned faith, okay. That means that it's faith which is, not, which is, reasoned faith is atarvati sadha. What it means is that, first of all, it means that if what you have faith in is shown to be wrong, then you'll change your faith. Okay, so that's one one aspect of reasoned faith. The other aspect of reasoned faith is that it's uh, proportional. Okay, in the sense that um, it's actually it's actually um, commensurate. It fits in with the evidence and with experience. Okay, it's not something which is completely beyond those things. Okay, I mean just uh, uh, to give you a a, a, an example of how this might work, we talked a bit last week about near-death experiences. So, you know, you maybe have somebody who, who comes to near to death and they maybe have a light and they feel like they're moving towards that and so on and so forth, right? So, uh, if faith arises from that, a reasonable faith would be to say, well, it seems that this is evidence that maybe there's something after death and maybe that death is not the end. So, that's like a reasonable kind of faith, yeah? But... To go too far would be to say, therefore, there is an eternal soul which exists in bliss in the bosom of the Lord. Okay? That's going too far because that's not actually justified by the evidence. Okay? 
So this is what reasoned faith is, that there's uh, a certain um, uh, humility and a certain moderation in what we have our faith in. So yes, we have faith in the Buddha because we believe that he was a very wise man who awoke to the nature of the human condition. And that seems to be reasonable. Um, so this is the arising of that faith. Dukkha Upanishads and then one of the nicest links that it says that this has in this whole kind of uh, pattern is that faith gives rise to gladness. Yeah. When we find that that which uh, nourishes us and that which satisfies our longing, then we feel glad, we feel happy. And this is just an ordinary kind of happiness. This is not transcendental bliss or anything like that. This is just, ah, oh, that feels good. I'm, I'm, I just make it so happy. So it's very nice, isn't it? Suffering gives rise to faith. Faith gives rise to happiness. Yeah? That kind of spiritual happiness. So we shouldn't be worried about our suffering. Okay? Don't worry if you suffer. Suffering is okay. Suffering's all right. You say, oh, that's right, that's what the Buddha said. He said, you're going to suffer, deal with it. Yeah? Here's my suffering, my job is to deal with it. Yeah? This is what the Buddha taught. And he taught the ending of suffering. Yeah? And so we have this gladness arising because what, what we have the faith in, how we choose to live our life is proportional and uh, 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 related to our actual experience. Okay, and again, to to have this remembering to keep that kind of humility about what we're saying, we don't therefore conclude that the Buddha was completely omniscient and knew everything. Okay, that's what a lot of people think. The Buddha knew everything. Come on, you know, Buddha didn't know what next week's lottery number was going to be. Why would he want to? Yeah, why would he want to know anything silly like that? The Buddha never claimed to know everything. The Buddha claimed, he specifically said, no, it's not true. It's not, he said it's not possible to know everything. Yeah? What he said was, what I know is about suffering and the ending of suffering. Those things I know, those two things. That's what I know. Okay? So we shouldn't get carried away with our faith. Right? Real faith is not like this excessive devotion or with, you know, attitude which refuses to question or inquire or anything like that. That's not real faith. That's a slightly kind of nervous, fearful faith. Yeah, if we don't want to question things, then it's because actually, in the back of our mind, we don't really have faith. Yeah, because if we really have faith, we can question and test in any way that we like. Yeah. So that real faith has that questioning attitude, and the gladness arises. Oh, okay. And then, and then there's like this kind of um, progression, this this um, uh, this maturing, um, this this evolving. It's like an evolution, like a spiritual evolution in our minds. So this first kind of gladness we call pamoja, is just an ordinary kind of gladness, and it's a, any kind of wholesome, simple happiness that you get from doing a good deed, that you get from reflecting on the Dhamma, that you get from coming here and, and being happy to see all your friends and to do some chanting. It's that ordinary, everyday kind of happiness that comes from things that are wholesome. And this is what that Pamoja is. It's nothing, okay? But it's, uh, it's crucial, yeah? It's, cru it's right in there. If you don't have that, then the, your way to liberation is not going to unfold. And so these, it's very important to reflect on these things because these are, um, these are uh, um, they're such a normal part of our life that we don't, we don't give them their due. We don't respect them enough. We don't think this is important enough. But actually, it's very, very important. You know, and I see so for my, my life as a monk, you can see that you're able to um, give this experience to so many people who, who, who love to come and they love to offer the dana or bring the food for the monks and, and uh, you know, fuss over you or buy you a new pair of socks and all of these kinds of things. And, 
You know, like Ajahn Brahm tells the story about how, how he never used to wear socks. And, uh, and uh, he's English, you know, he doesn't feel the cold. So he never used to wear socks. And then one time, the, some of the ladies at the Buddhist society bought him a new pair of socks and they came in and they gave him a pair of socks. And so he thought, oh, okay, well, I better wear them. So he kind of wore them for the Dhamma talk. And he was sitting there cross-legged in the Dhamma talk, not on a chair like this. And normally your feet are hidden under your robes. And he saw that the ladies who'd offered the, the socks were sitting there in the audience. So he sort of gradually, while he was giving the Dhamma talk, kind of shuffled his feet out from underneath his robe so that his, his sock was there. And he saw them say, oh, look, 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 there, he's got our socks on. <laughs> yeah? So this is the Pamoja. Yeah? This is the Pamoja. It's very simple. And we try to, to um, give people that chance to do that. And uh, again, when I was with, with Ajahn Brahm a few weeks ago and he's at the monastery, and because I don't know if you've seen, but I've got a very small bowl. Yeah? And when people ask, see, normally in the Thai tradition, monks have very big bowls. Yeah? And they say, we've got the tradition of having very big bowls. So Ajahn Brahm's got a very big bowl. I've got a very small one. And so when people ask me about it, I said that the size of the bowl is, is proportionate with the size of your defilements. So the greedy monks <laughs> have little bowls. Uh, and so, uh, sorry, the, 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 the content monks and, uh, have little bowls and the greedy ones have big bowls. And Ajahn Brahm says, no, that's not true. It's, it's, it's related to the size of your metta. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, monks have a lot of metta, have a big bowl so that lay people can put lots of food in there and feel very happy. Yeah? <laughs> so... Uh, is a pamoja. Now, when when we come to meditate, right? So yeah, we're all kind of sitting here. We have this kind of wholesome feeling. We're kind of laughing a bit, and we have that pamoja. Yeah, that's what it is. You have that pamoja now. Yeah. Now, when we come to sit to meditate, we take that same feeling and we take it to a new level. Okay, we refine it. Okay, and this is this is like a step, which is. Um, a bit further than sort of everyday or normal spirituality would encompass. Okay, so through normal routine spirituality, like say giving dana or doing a puja or you know whatever, you know you may get it in different religious environments. You might get it from singing hymns or praying or something like that, and then you would get this kind of pramoja. But then to take to the next step is what we call rapture, is piti, and that's another. Um, stage of refinement. Okay, it's not something different. Okay, it's not a different thing. It's a refinement of that same joy in your mind, which, when you apply yourself um, in a in a um, uh, considered and uh, methodical way in your meditation, will uh, mature and deepen. And so this is like that story I was mentioning earlier of that time when I went to the Dhamma talk and we laughed a lot. And then after the talk, I went back and had very, very, my meditation went very, very fast, okay? Because the, the, um, the mind already had that pamoja and then was able to move to the next stage of rapture very, very quickly. There is just straight away. So rapture is basically a refined sense of, it's an elevated sense of joy and delight, Okay. Um, it can um, and and often does manifest in all kinds of slightly strange ways in your meditation. Okay, so one of the one of the best ways to understand rapture is you think of rapture is like a, an emotional response to your meditation. Okay, and it's a slightly excited emotional response. Rapture is like a kind of excitement. Okay, it's a kind of Zest, sometimes they translate it as zest or enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is quite good, actually. Enthusiasm means being filled with the God. Yeah? Uh, Thus is the, uh, the, the Theos, is the God. Yeah? So it's being filled with the divine light or something like that. So this is what rapture is like. And it can f feel in many different ways. You, know, you can get this feeling, I don't know if you've ever had like feeling like hair standing up on your skin while you're meditating. Yeah? This one's quite common. This is a kind of rapture. Or you feel like a kind of an electric shock goes through your body. Yeah? 
or sometimes you can sort of shake, you start shaking, and the kind of energy comes in your body, you know, shaking thing. Or your, your, some of your arms can fling out. This used to happen to me all the time. I was be sitting there, and my arm would just sort of <laughs> fling out like that. And uh, uh, many different kinds of things. And uh, one of the funny one is like the Michelin Man rapture, where you feel like you're sitting there and you sort of go, you, sort of, and you feel like, God, I didn't know I put on that much weight. And you're kind of sitting there and you feel like you've blown up. Or you can feel like incredibly heavy. You feel like you've turned to stone. Yeah? But not heavy in a, in a kind of tired way, but heavy in like rock solid. You sit there, boom. Or, or on the contrary, you can feel very light. You feel like you're floating up into the air. Yeah? So you feel like, Ooh, you're going up into the air. Don't open your eyes, okay? <laughs> Unless you've got a very soft meditation seat, okay? Okay. <laughs> you're floating, okay? Now, all of these are kinds of rapture and many other kinds of rapture, okay? Um, it's very individual. And again, you think of it, it's like a, a positive emotional response to your meditation, okay? But what you want is a, what they call paranapiti, is a, a, a pervasive rapture. And this is the one that soaks through your whole body, okay? So when I'm doing the metta meditation, I'm talking about taking the metta feeling of joy and soaking it, pervading it through your body. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop this paranapiti, okay? And that's the one which will become really solid and lead your mind into samadhi. If you can do that and to keep that and sustain it, then the next stage that arises is a stage of what we call pasadhi or uh, tranquility, okay? So tranquility, or that, that sort of excited feeling starts to die down and tranquilize, okay? Just get an even. And so this is not a stillness that comes from forcing your mind to hammer away at a meditation object, okay? Saying, watch the breath, boom, 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 okay, is meditation time up yet or not? No, 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 keep on going. That's not that kind of stillness. That's not tranquility, okay? Tranquility comes like the stillness in a pool of water. Yeah? It comes through its own nature. It comes when you are not getting in there and interfering with it, okay? And so this is why I sometimes say that um, the purpose of a meditation object is to distract you from your meditation, okay? The purpose of a meditation object is to distract you from your meditation. You understand? No? Are you so conceited that you think that you can actually do your meditation? Of course you can't. Your mind does the meditation by itself. Nature does the meditation. You just have to stop interfering with it. Okay? So we give you something to do. It'll keep you happy. You give a little playpen, okay? <laughs> and, 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 and we convince you, right? We give you this, it's like this psychological spin that makes you think, Oh, yes, here I am doing my meditation. I'm very virtuous and very good. And, and so, oh, this is good. And you're there playing. And meanwhile, behind your back, without you even noticing it, your mind is becoming peaceful. Yeah? This is actually how it feels. You can actually turn around sometimes from your med You've been so busy watching your meditation object that sometimes you can actually go, Oh, my mind's become peaceful. I didn't even notice. Yeah? So the job of the meditation object is to keep you from interfering with your mind. Your mind will become peaceful all by itself. Yeah? Just like if there's a pool of water which is all stirred up. You know, how do you stop that? Do you jump into the pool of water and start to press the waves down? No, 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 wave, get down, get down. Oh, there's dirt there. Oh, no, push the dirt down. Yeah? Is that how you do it? No, of course not. You get out of the water and you just wait. Yeah? But because, and that's actually one meditation object that you can do. Like people who are very good at meditation... They can just do that. They don't need to use a meditation object. You can just sit there and just wait and the mind becomes still by itself. You don't have to do anything else. But for most of us, we need something to distract us, to keep us busy, because otherwise we just get a bit nervous. We think, well, maybe I'll just go in there and just press this bit of water down and make this a bit still here and do this, that. Yeah? So we're trying to distract ourselves and give ourselves a meditation object to keep us out of trouble. So this is pasadi, is this tranquility. And then the next factor is we call sukha. Sukha meaning bliss. Okay, sukha in Buddhism is just a general word for any kind of happiness or whatever, a pleasure or anything. It can be many different kinds. 
But in this context, sukha is a very refined kind of happiness and pleasure. So translated as bliss. And uh, that kind of bliss is like a, 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 um, uh, like a very sweet old liqueur. Yeah? Yeah? It's, it's, it's very warm and very deep. Yeah? Have a glass of, go when you go back home, have a nice glass of sweet liqueur. I'm oh, not really recommending it, it's just. A, and it sort of settles down and you get this kind of warm glow. Yeah? That's, that's what sukkah is like, except it's much better. Right? And it has that, um, it has that, it has a very, um, how do I say this? Um, uh, st- or st- not sticky, but but a- attractive quality. It like pulls you in. It sucks you in. Yeah. So that so that it, it it draws the mind in to be with the meditation object and will keep it there. Okay. And so this is where you, when 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 that has sukha in the mind, has bliss in the mind. This is when that deep sense of of stillness and concentration will start to develop. The mind will start to become very one-pointed. And then one of the the crucial elements in that is sukupanisa samadhi. Happiness is the condition, the vital condition for samadhi, for concentration. Okay, So when all these factors are developing, ripening in the mind, the mind will withdraw into itself and become one. Okay, so what samadhi means? It means the mind withdrawing into itself and becoming one. Okay. Another way uh, 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 of of thinking about samadhi is is of of letting go. So there's two aspects to samadhi. One is what you're letting go of, and then the other is what you're going into. Okay. So what you're letting go of is sight, sound, smell, taste, touches. Okay. That whole panorama of the external world is being let go of. And one's going into the stillness in the mind. Okay. And this is what we call samadhi. And so the mind goes into a place that's very bright and very clear, very joyful, and it just rests there. So samadhi, uh, we were discussing this a little bit in the monastery in the last few days, and we had a fellow who's staying there who's a, a yoga practitioner, and we were comparing the way samadhi is used in the yoga tradition to how it's used in Buddhism. And in the yoga tradition, I have this definition of what is it? The mind that shines forth as if uh, empty of its own intrinsic form, something like that. It's kind of quite um, abstruse uh, definition of samadhi in the Yoga Sutra. and in a sense, the samadhi within a Hindu or yogic tradition seems to be in some sense the end of the road. It's, it's the goal of the practice. So for Buddhism, it's not the goal of the practice. It's part of the path. Okay? It's a resting place for the mind. Okay? So we've now gone from that ordinary situation of being filled with suffering and we've developed our mind through ordinary states of joy and progressively more refined states of happiness until... The mind comes into oneness, and there's this complete sense of rest, okay, and a very deep sense of rest in that samadhi. Now that lasts for a period of time. Might be a you know, an hour or whatever it lasts for, and then the mind comes out. It'll just come out by itself. You don't have to worry about that. When it comes out, the Buddha said the next stage is. Samadhupanisa yatha bhutanyana dasana. Samadhi is the vital condition for knowing and seeing uh, in accordance with reality. Okay? Especially in accordance with conditions. Yatha bhuta, in accordance with conditions, perhaps translating it. So, what that means is that when your mind comes out of meditation, out of the deep meditation, when the mind is very clear and very still, you know and understand things as they really are. The mind, like that classic simile of the still forest pool. Yeah? The mind, all the dirt and everything is settled to the bottom of the pool and you can see through the water and you can see what's in there. You can see the fishes swimming around, you can see the weeds uh, waving at the bottom of the pool and so on. 
And this is the nature of the mind that has samadhi, that it can see how things really are. <coughs> and in particular, what you understand is the nature of the mind, because you understand the very nature of this process that you've gone through. Okay? Understand that? When we say know and see things as they really are, we don't mean looking out into the world and understanding how the stock markets are going to be next week. Okay? That's not knowing, th seeing how things as they really are. We mean understanding what is that actual process in our mind which we've just been through. That's what it means. Okay? So we understand, oh, okay, here where I was. I started with this suffering. I, I encountered the Dhamma. I had faith arising. I felt this gladness with the Dhamma. Then practiced meditation, developed these kinds of uh, qualities in my meditation. It led to that state of samadhi. And this is how my mind works. Ah, I understand. This is the conditions that affect my mind in this way. And so you see this, how it really is. Okay? And one of the things that you see when you look in that way is you understand impermanence. Okay? And you see that all of these states, even that very exalted and beautiful state of samadhi, is conditioned. And when the conditions have finished, that state will finish. It's all impermanent. Okay? And that, that depth of seeing impermanence will, will, will like sink down far greater, to a far greater level than you've ever known or thought of before. It's not just that, yes, things will be impermanent at a certain time. See, one of the, one of the problems, I think, which I have a bit of a problem with in, in, in the way that modern Theravada teachings on impermanence tend to phrase it, is that they tend to say, well, ultimate level impermanence is, is like an atomic level impermanence. So you've got the very fast momentariness. Very, very fast. Everything's breaking up very, very fast. And that's real impermanence. That's ultimate impermanence. Okay? Now, the Buddha never talked like this. Okay? He didn't use the word momentariness. Okay? He never talked about impermanence in this manner. Actually, he talked about impermanence on any different level. Okay? Not like there's an ultimate atomic level of impermanence on which other ones are built. But it's more like, if you, if you know a little bit about chaos theory, you know about, you've heard about fractals. Okay, so a fractal is a phenomena, a mathematical phenomena, which will display a similar form at any kind of level of magnification. A classic example of a fractal phenomena is a shoreline. Okay? So if you, if you um, uh, zoom in with a camera and then just look at a few grains of sand on the, on the beach, on the shoreline of the, where the water is lapping up against the beach, and you analyze the shape of that line, it has a certain degree of randomness to it. Okay? Now, if you then back off a metre and you analyse that, it has a certain degree of randomness. If you back off another 10, 10 metres, 100 metres, 1 kilometre, 10 kilometres, at every level, when you analyse that, it will tend to have a similar level of randomness to the shoreline. Okay? And that's what we call a fractal phenomena. It displays a similar characteristic at any scale. Okay? And that's the kind of thing that impermanence is. It's not that ultimate impermanence is at one level or another, but that whatever level we look at, it's always impermanent. Okay? And what that means is that impermanence is the nature of impermanence. Things are, by their very, their very essence, is to disappear and break up. And the more we look at them, the more they just disappear in front of our eyes. And this is what you start to see. And so this causes the mind to retract. And when you see this, there's like this, this pushing away. Okay? Now that can be, at this stage, a kind of negative emotional response to these things, okay? to, to, to the mind or reality or existence or whatever. Okay? Remember, however, that that comes at the end of this whole psychological process of developing the faith, the happiness, the joy, the tranquility, all of those things to a very deep degree. So our mind is very content, very relaxed, and we're ready to take on board the awful truth. <laughs> okay? So this is why it's not right to sort of say, oh, the Buddha taught impermanence, therefore we just should just start, everything's impermanent, 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 and see that. That's not what the Buddha said. Okay? The Buddha said that the knowledge of impermanence will arise when the mind is prepared in the right way. Okay? And then you'll really see it. And then you'll be prepared for it. And so the mind retracts. And that, that, that retraction or that uh, repulsion we call nibida, 
And it's a bit like the repulsion of two magnets, if you put the positive poles of two magnets together. It's like a force that pushes away. Yeah? And so the mind turns away from conditioned things. Okay? It turns away from, from um, uh, um, involvement in what is going to be impermanent and conditioned and where it's going to lead to suffering. And then that leads to a very nice word, viraga, which in one translated, translates in two ways. One which translates as dispassion. Okay? Someone's not attached to things anymore. It also translates as fading away. Okay? And it's used as the word for like cloth. If you have a cloth and, and you wash it many times and the colours fade out of it, it's, it's the same word is used. Yeah? And so it's the fading away. Yeah? The fading away. And then the other word, nirodha, cessation. So this is the ending. And then vimuti is liberation. It's coming at the end of these things. So you're seeing things as they are. There's a period when the mind is pushed away, turned away from conditions, and then there's a sense of freedom. There's a liberation from it. Yeah? And this is the, 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 the outcome of this whole process, is freedom. And Buddha said it was like, um, like a, a, uh, uh, the rain which falls on the mountaintops. And when the rain falls on the mountaintops and it makes little puddles and little rivulets on the, in the hill, and they sort of flow down together. Little things that you wouldn't think is, you know, it's just a little, little bit of water on the ground. It's nothing, no big deal. And then they flow into each other and they make a little stream. And they flow down a bit further and they make a big stream. And then eventually they flow down and they make a huge river. Yeah? And then a mighty river flows down and flows all the way into the ocean. And then it loses itself in the ocean. Yeah. So this is the simile that the Buddha taught in this context. So this is what that teaching of dependent liberation is teaching us, that there is this freedom, there is this unconditioned, we call Nibbāna, the unconditioned. But that unconditioned is reached through a conditioned way of practice, a conditioned way of practice that starts with where you are at right now, the suffering that we're all feeling right now, and that evolves through a natural process of understanding, of, um, uh, of joy, of a very kind of positive emotional development, and which at the right time will lead to a turning away from and a letting go of all conditions. And that is the state that we call freedom. That state of freedom is not a state of mind. Okay? So freedom in Buddhism is not a state of mind because all states of mind are impermanent. Okay? Freedom goes deeper than that. It's deeper than the mind. It's not a psychological state. It's an existential state. Yeah? It's freedom from existence. So this is my little talk for you this evening on dependent liberation. And I hope that's been of some amusement for you and that you've got enough giggles out of it at least to go home and do some nice meditation. <laughs>